This is Jeff Dice, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. We are continuing our walkthrough of Mises' magnum opus titled Human Action, of course. And we have worked our way up to part five of that book. And our guest this weekend is our friend, the editor of Mises.org, and also an economist in his own right, Ryan McMakin. Great to hear from you, Ryan. Hello, it's great to be here. Well, so people who are tuning in, as you know, if you've been following the series, we've been trying to get you interested, you meaning the layman, uh, interested in reading this book and wrestling with it. And especially if you have maybe some extra downtime as a result of the coronavirus uh, shutdown. And if you recall, we've already gone through part one of the book, which was really about human action and philosophy and epistemology with David Gordon. Uh, We walked through uh, the second part of the book with Dr. Bob Murphy, which was about human action within society. Uh, Part three of the book on economic calculation, which got into some really interesting concepts of value and marginal utility, that sort of thing, was with our friend uh, Per Byland. And then uh, part four of the book, which was lengthy, we broke that up into three separate podcasts because it was hundreds and hundreds of pages. And we had our great friends, uh, Jeff Herbner, we had Mark Thornton, the Mises Institute, and also Dr. Joe Salerno, the Mises Institute. So we walked through all kinds of things about catalactics and exchange and monetary calculation and banking and, and business cycles and all that sort of thing. So if you're thinking about this as sort of a both a philosophy book and also a textbook. That's the structure laid out so far. And part five is, is a shift. So part five is very short. Uh, this, it's comprised of just chapters 25 and 26 in the book. Uh, if you're following along in the scholars edition, it's pages 685 to 711. So literally only about 25 or 30 pages here, which is fun. And so I thought I'd ask Ryan to join us and, and walk through stuff here because so I think what, what Mises is doing here, Ryan, uh, structurally in the book anyway, is that he's shifting. He's, he's set up some constructs in the beginning part of the book. And even when those constructs are imaginary, they help us uh, understand the world. So he set up like the idea of a Robinson Crusoe society where you're only where you're not acting catalactically exchanging with others, but you're, you're sort of making decisions on your own as to how to spend your time. And then he gets into the imaginary construct of the ERE, the evenly rotating economy, which is where supply and demand meet perfectly at a, at a set price, and, and these prices don't change. Factors of production, inputs, outputs are static, and that gives us a model with which to sort of better understand a world that is not an evenly rotating economy. And now... He's giving us another construct, and in fact, uh, Ryan, chapter 25 is called The Imaginary Construction of a Socialist Society. So you know, give us, I guess, your overall thoughts on the chapter and, and where it sort of fits in the book. Well, you know, you sometimes forget when you're just uh, engaging Mises in general and not thinking about him in uh, terms of specific books. You forget that what's in some books and what's not in some others. And uh, so I was reminded by reading this that most of his um, his discussion of why socialism doesn't work and so on uh, is covered in socialism and uh, in some other works. And he's he's really building more of an edifice about markets here. And so it's this interesting short chapter where he's he's engaging this issue of uh, what is the socialist society? Uh, just to paint a picture of if we just completely got rid of the markets, what would it look like? And uh, he ha- offers really a nice summary here, because as you know, it's it's really quite short. So if you wanted just to, to get a sense of um, what's Mises' general thinking on could you do an economy without markets— uh, how would you do that? And of course, you can't really do that. But uh, he offers kind of he, what an attempt would look like and what some of uh, the uh, the attempts um, have led to in the past, just in a, a brief summary. And this imaginary construction idea, of course, he, he covers this topic in lots of different places and the necessity of having imaginary constructions of markets and societies and so on and its uses, but also that there are significant drawbacks and what this might lead to in terms of errors and so on. So he he provides a lot of historical context here in the chapter, beginning with this idea of the, the state 
has long inhabited in people's minds this concept of something that is above and beyond the individual. And this goes way, way back, at least uh, to the ancient Greeks, of course, probably to uh, the quote unquote oriental despotisms of old. This idea that the state offers insights and uh, uh, a view of the common good that selfish individuals cannot provide. And so Mises starts in with that of, well, we're, we're starting from a flawed place already with many people because many people already believe this idea. And this is pre-modern. This isn't just something socialists came up with. This idea that you, you've got individuals and they pursue their own little things. Uh, and th- that's flawed because those people, they're not thinking of society overall. But fortunately, we have the state which can offer a broader view and has a more dispassionate view of the common good and and what needs to be done, and the state can guide us then to a better, greater good. And uh, Mises doesn't doesn't care for that at all and, and rejects it, whether it's being offered up by socialists or traditionalist conservatives or any other group out of the past. Well, it, yes, he does start out here with a, a, a section on the origins Uh, of socialism, and he particularly points out the social reformers of the 18th century, and he draws some parallels between um, monarchs and kings and also the church and clergy and how these come together. And oftentimes, I think in modern sense, again, he's writing this in the 1940s, people say like, well, capitalism sort of comes out of feudalism and monarchs. But he says in this great, uh, I always like to point out his language, in this great sentence here at the top of page 687, again in the, in, the, in the scholar's edition, he says, the essential characteristic of the imaginary construction of this king's ideal regime is that all its citizens are unconditionally subject to authoritarian control. So in the absence of markets, in my eyes, or to my mind, he's actually uh, positing socialism as the progeny of monarchs, when in fact, I think a lot of people think capitalism is is what flowed from monarchy. Right. And just this without the idea that you could have people who were just subjected to the arbitrary will of some ruler. I don't I don't think socialism is possible. And that's a point that he wants to make sure and make is that you you need to have the the seed of this idea in the thought that it it makes sense, that it's reasonable, that uh, it's rational even. And that's that's kind of a point he notes is that this idea of, well, the market is chaos, but the state is rational. And as, as long as you've got that idea, which um, he is he is saying uh, emanated from monarchical authoritarianism uh, from previous centuries, then that's 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 a necessary component of, of transferring over. Uh, to socialist management. And of course, you know, there's a lot of variety that uh, was originally uh, available in Europe. It's not like all these regimes are exactly the same, but a lot of them really carried this basic idea that the state can hand down these managerial decisions and manage society. But of course, Mises is demonstrating a wide variety of ways that having one person at the top deciding which direction society should go in is not, uh, it's not sustainable, and uh, it doesn't work on many, many levels. Well, it's interesting. A lot of listeners will probably know of Mises' personal atheism, and I think his, his liberal worldview. You'll get, uh, I think, drips and drabs of, a, of a, you'll catch glimpses of hostility, perhaps, to religion in his writing, and there's some evidence that that might have changed uh, at the very end of his life or toward the very end of his life slightly. Uh, and But you certainly get a couple of jabs here on 688 and 689, I think, where he's talking about, um, you know, s- socialism is like a religion. It requires self-deification. Uh, the, the state becomes the, the overall government and that you need and, – and it, it especially points out that the state becomes omniscient. And omniscience is, of course, something we normally attach to deities. Uh, so I think he's, uh, he's having a little bit of fun with us here. But, you know, I – What's interesting, though, Ryan, is he's writing this again in the 40s, but he does not point out the distributism of of Catholicism that we normally associate with the late 19th and early 20th century, which was, you know, Chesterton and was a thing, obviously, by then that he would have been familiar with. But he doesn't mention that. He's talking more about the 18th century social reformers. So, I mean, is your sense that he's not um, thinking of the Catholic Church here? (laughs) 
No, I think he's taking a much broader view. Um, I don't think he has any actually specific axes to grind uh, when it comes to religion. I, I, I think Mises has this general idea of, of rationality that, that many liberals of a certain type embraced, um, and not just Mises in any way. Uh, because, I mean, you could apply this general idea. I mean, he's, he's coming down against uh, this throne and altar, I think, ideal of, uh, of political rule. And I don't think that applied to any specific time or place about in his sort of modeling that could have could have been post-Reformation in lots of places, could have been medieval. Uh, you could look at the absolute estates of England, which was Protestant, or France, which was Catholic, and those would all seem to apply to what he's talking about mm-hmm. here. And so then he 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 notes interestingly. Um, this idea of how you can create this state that that has all of these attributes, which are some sort of mystic ideal, and it, the the irony he notes is that it was the liberals who came up with this model of the ideal society, but to liberals it was just a model. So the liberals wanted to be able to create this model, which would show, which would help critique then these authoritarian models that existed at the time. Uh, and to show why they were wrong and, and didn't work. But then the socialists and, the, uh, and other authoritarians took it a step further. Oh, look, it's possible to have an ideal society. It's possible to have an ideal state. And let's figure out how to do it. And Mises, of course, thinks that was a step in the wrong direction because uh, that's something he keeps coming back to is, is what is practicable uh, in terms of uh, government action and noting that the, the purpose of... Uh, action in the marketplace or whatever it is that the state is doing cannot really ever be the uh, this some sort of metaphysical ideal. It's the best you can do with current conditions and technology and knowledge at any given time. And to then uh, pursue this idea of some sort of ideal uh, is a mistake. Uh, but that's exactly what the socialists do. They're taking this concept of the ideal society that the liberals invented and then saying, oh, well, we can actually produce that. And that leads to lots of errors and to the deification of the state, which which he talks about. Well, we're certainly experiencing that today. Uh, this is <laughs> these issues are not going away. I'm just reading today about a congressional plan to just start spending sending everyone in the United States two grand a month until the crisis is over. Uh, so it's not like these ideas are are just being studied in some kind of museum. They're right in front of us. Um, you know, Ryan, what's interesting is obviously some of the parallels between the, the, the faith-based uh, view of government, which, which aligns a lot like religion. You have deities, you have sacred texts, you have all of these things. And uh, I'm not sure that everyone in our audience might understand what academia was like in the 40s and 50s and how radical this was. I mean, this was gutsy stuff to be writing this about socialism. And, and in fact, he lists later in the chapter the three dogmas of socialism. And we mentioned these, oh gosh, way back about a year ago, we did a podcast on, the, on Mises' book, 1922 Socialism with Dr. Sean Rittenauer. And we also touched on his earlier essay called Economic Calculation, the Socialist Commonwealth, if you want to go back and look at those. Uh, so he talked about, you know, the, the socialist dogma, which was still very, very strong in the 1940s and 50s, was uh, ha- has sort of three components. First, that society or there's, as you alluded to earlier, there's this omniscient, uh, an omnipotent thing above and beyond us as individuals. Second, that socialism is inevitable, which is still believed by an awful lot of people today. It's inexorable. It's going to happen. And that progress and socialism are sort of synonyms. And finally, third, uh, that, you know, uh, there's a deterministic arc to all this, that socialism means going from worse to better conditions, and this is always happening, and that this is, of course, moral. Uh, and these dogmas are still uh, very much alive. I mean, you can really feel them in in the Bernie movement or in AOC or in a lot of places in America. Yeah, I enjoyed that uh, that nice point that Mises makes here about what Marx came up with and what he didn't come up with. He's careful to note that socialism is quite old, predates Marx considerably. This idea that you could abolish markets and just come up with this socialist idea, not something Marx invented at all. And notes that uh, M- Marx's real innovation was, yep, as you noted, it's inevitable and it's the march of progress. And every... 
current age we're in is better than the previous age by virtue of the fact that we believe that as time marches on, people just become better and society becomes better. So this automatically makes socialism superior to what came before it, which was capitalism, and there's no use fighting it. And if you're fighting it, it's just because you're some sort of bourgeois troglodyte. And that actually leads to the other innovation that Mises discusses, and he only me- he only just mentions it, he doesn't really describe it at all, is... Um, how he Mises or Marx hatched out the doctrine of polylogism, which I believe he discusses elsewhere in human action. The idea that there are some people who who are enlightened by virtue of the social class they're in, or because they're a certain type of intellectual, and so on. These people can understand why socialism is good. These people can understand that is it is inevitable. These people can understand why it works, but. If you're tainted mentally or emotionally by bourgeois ideals, then you can never understand socialism. Uh, You can never really understand how it works or anything like that. So that when people opposed socialism, uh, it was really just because they were emotionally uh, and spiritually deficient. It wasn't because they had any sort of rational argument. They just simply couldn't understand it because their tiny bourgeois brains weren't suited to understanding the new realities. Uh, and that's, and he, he points out elsewhere that this is really kind of sort of a, a doctrine employed by racists also, <laughs> which is that, well, certain groups of humans can be rational, but other sorts of group, uh, groups of mm. humans will always be slaves because they can't possibly comprehend the notion of private property and so on. Uh, and as you can imagine, he rejects that idea, uh, but then says, look, the Marxists, the Marxists just basically stole that idea uh, and applied it to their own notions of polylogism. So, yeah, he, he didn't invent socialism at all. He just came up with these these uh, crafty arguments explaining why anyone who opposes socialism is therefore irrational or emotionally defective somehow and just refuses to embrace the uh, the new world that is hatching. And so you don't even have to really address these people. Just ignore them because that's why they don't they don't understand socialism because they're they're too stupid or uh, they're wrong on other grounds, not because uh, they're making better arguments. And so that helped immensely. That Mises says here that that worked for a while and actually helped silence the critics of socialism for quite some time. But as time has gone on, the socialists have actually had to address how will socialism actually work, because they completely ignored that for decades, and never actually argued, Marx didn't argue, this is how socialism would work, and basically ignored it, and notes other economists that tried to figure it out but failed. And so now we're just now getting to the point of how socialism would work, and they're still coming up with, I in, by now, I mean, 1949, um, just now getting the idea of how it would work. And they're, they're failing miserably, as, as Mises notes, and says, we've already seen a couple of experiments. We've got the Soviet experiment. we got the Nazi, the National Socialist experiment. And those aren't working uh, for the reasons I'm mm. about to point out here. That's funny. One of the great things about being an austere libertarian is when someone says, well, how would that work? What would that look like? You can just say, I don't know. <laughs> right? We're not, we're not trying to plan anything. We're just going to let it go. You know, what would private money look like? I don't know. Um, that's my favorite new expression in 2020 is I don't know. Right? <laughs> I, think the, I think our goal for 2020 should be uh, for uh, uh, people in, in uh, public places to have fewer opinions and voice them less frequently. That's my hope for this year. Uh, what's, what's great here, Ryan, is that at the very end of the chapter 25, you know, he brings up praxeology, which is, of course, his notion of the actual study of human nature and human action of which economics is a subset. But in socialism, we're presumed to have sort of one director or one will across society. So that's, that's a real problem for, from a praxeology, praxeological perspective. And of course, there's the question, and throughout this book, he uses the term division of labor almost as a synonym for social cooperation. In other words, it's a healthy thing. It's all about, there was an earlier chapter in, the, in, in part four about uh, social harmony and cooperation. So this is something that Mises views as the very pith of civilization, that this uh, division of labor and social cooperation. In fact, he almost called the book social cooperation instead of human action. So he asked this question, can a socialist system operate as a system of the division of labor? 
And that's really from a praxeology, praxeological, I keep messing this up, from a praxeological perspective, that's really the question. That's a tough question. Right. And we're seeing kind of shadows of that today uh, in this whole, well, what, wh who's essential and who's, a, who's non essential? And oh, well, we can all agree that people who work in grocery stores, that's great. Um, but who else is essential? And of course, they have no idea. They're just kind of grasping in the dark. They're just selecting those things which seem uh, to, well, obviously, food delivery is good. So I, governor, shall decide that's important. But then you start to get down the production line a little bit and you start to wonder, well, what about people who make auto parts? What about people who deliver auto parts? Do you, are you, Mr. Governor, aware of all of the different things that go into making auto parts or repairing automobiles uh, or maintaining a garage that keeps all of these delivery trucks and everything going? And you start to get to the point where they don't know what sorts of labor are necessary and how it should be divided up among the population. And yeah, it might see, seem easy if you take a, um, a extreme case. Oh, well, we've decided that people who compose epic poems are unessential. Okay, but how many of those people exist? Whereas mm -hmm. you got a lot of people who uh, do insurance. Insurance is pretty important to delivery of groceries in a variety of ways. Uh, and bankers, of course, are important, but they're okay because they'll always be kept solvent by the Fed. So, all right. But all those other things that people who are involved in the production of daily needs need other than simply that guy who delivers groceries in a truck. This is an extremely complex economy. And if, if you're just a socialist who says, well, we'll pick and decide what your job is and we'll figure out what's essential and what's not. Uh, and what you'll get paid for, and who doesn't need pay, well, you start to run into problems uh, real quick. Not least of all, because you're you're then also screwing up uh, the economy in terms of people who are well-suited to certain lines of work and not well-suited to others, and who has talents for this, and who has capital for that. And it's it, you go down this road almost immediately of legalizing things that are seemingly necessary but might, might not be, and then making illegal things uh, that uh, are actually necessary and end up impeding your ability to deliver goods and services. And that's why uh, those it's so important to not have a single decision maker. And he keeps coming back to that issue of there's this one will that will then guide the direction that the market goes – but there's no good reason to assume that that is a rational or a good idea because people simply cannot know just one person uh, what needs to be produced and what doesn't and how, what shortages that might lead to and uh, how it could really bring the whole system to uh, a standstill in some cases. Now, of course, there there's enough leeway being allowed right now and historically in a variety of socialist regimes that describe themselves as socialists and weren't fully socialist. They realized quickly, we've got to at least allow some people to function freely here or things are going to lock up. And that's that famous new economic policy experiment, right? Where when the Soviet Union was new, they locked everything down and then there were shortages immediately and famines were brewing and all of that. And then Lenin realized real quick, oh, well, we better allow some flexibility here or we're all going to starve. And uh, so we're going to, so, okay, we'll loosen up there. We'll, just as long as the state controls the commanding heights of the economy, right? The railroads and the, and the huge installations and the factories and so on, then we can still maintain state control. But immediately they had to, recognize that you can't just have total and real socialism because you'll quickly starve. And what he's, what he's really, the, the real problem there is, is they were abolishing the division of labor and, uh, and the free movement of labor from place to place and the movement of capital and allowing this quote unquote chaotic system to happen. And that's the strain that leads us up right here as he starts out talking about well, there's this problem where people think that the state is rational and the state offers uh, control and the state offers order, whereas markets are chaos because it's just people doing whatever they want. But what he points out is that the real chaos isn't trying to control the markets in this way because people are just grasping around blindly. And when you put one person in charge, they really have no idea how to actually organize society.
Yeah, and a couple of points in these two chapters, he really uses the cool phrase, anarchy of production, <laughs> which uh, socialists don't like this I- idea of just anarchic production occurring uh, uh, by whim of the market. They want to they run it. But that's really about it for this very brief chapter 25. I would like to point out, though, at the very end of it, he's got this beautiful little paragraph that just shows throughout it all. I mean, here's this magnificent man, this brilliant writer, uh, not omniscient, of course, not, not uh, but nonetheless, uh, obviously a great mind. And he's so humble. And he shows that humility when he says toward the end of the chapter, he says, it's important to realize that this problem has nothing at all to do with evaluation of the ultimate ends. And, and he continued, meaning uh, the, the one will socialist decision maker. He says, our problem, the crucial and only problem of socialism is a purely economic problem and as such refers to means and not to ultimate ends. So Mises, the utilitarian liberal, once again shows humility and says, you know what, folks, I'm not even here to judge um, you know, the ends chosen are, are particularly even how those ends were arrived at, but rather we're here as economists in a vert free uh, system, meaning value free, the German word, to, to just study the connection between means and ends. So even after all of his demolition of socialism uh, decades earlier and again in that chapter, uh, you know, he he comes in with a little bit of humility, and I thought that that was uh, you're, you know I don't know Ryan, I don't know why that struck me, but it did. Well, as an editor, I always enjoy it when a writer sticks to the point and makes it clear what point they're trying to make, and don't overreach. And so, yeah, I I think that's very valuable in his writing. He's trying to be precise. He's trying to say this is the actual argument I'm making. It's not that he doesn't make other broader arguments somewhere else or uses other arguments elsewhere. He's just trying to stay focused here uh, in the text and say, this is the problem. This is the the problem we're addressing here. And that's I think that's what a good scholar does is they don't try to do everything all the time. Um, Now, of course, if you're delivering a political speech or so on, that's something else entirely. But this is a this is a book where he's trying to stay precise and focused, and I really like how he he does that. And you're right, that that does require some humility because it's. It's admitting that uh, you're not solving all the world's problems here right now. Yeah, if there's one thing we need, it's more humility and saying we don't know. That's, to me, the whole point of Austro-Libertarianism is allowing people the freedom to work these things out. As, so as we turn to the second chapter in this short part of the book, the, uh, chapter 26, the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism. So that sounds a little bit more like what we're used to from Mises. And Ryan, I was struck, he starts out with this idea of the director, meaning the, the socialist hive mind or the one will or whatever it is. And, and he gives us a very simple example. Rather than some grandiose public works program for the government to engineer or some war for the government to go wage, he says, so let's just take a simple house. With the, you know, the director wants to build a house. Well, first they have to decide where, you know, what land, and that has some opportunity cost. And then uh, they have to figure out, since they don't have market prices, they have to figure out materials and labor and how long it takes to build it and, and how much to pay the architect and all this and that. So it's it's actually a, a very neat little example with just something as simple as a house. And, and if you think about what goes into a house or building one, it's pretty staggering and, and awfully tough to command from, from far away. Yeah, the, this reminded me, too, of how bonkers it's become in some sections of society where you, you could imagine where uh, someone is talking about building themselves a house and uh, <laughs> and trying to decide some of these things about, well, should there be a bay window here or what sort of materials should we use and what side of the hill should we build it on? But then saying, you know what, let's just let's let's have an algorithm decide for me. We'll just we'll feed a bunch of data into some sort of AI and it'll come back and tell us what sort of house to build. The reality of course is someone might get that recommendation, but then they're likely to override it if it turns out that what they really do want is a bay window, even though the algorithm tells them not to. Because so much of this just comes down to things that cannot be quantified. Uh what is the how do you want your house to be built? What do you want it to feel like inside? And, 
it's <laughs> not only can you not do this for yourself, really, in re reducing everything to just an equation, but you certainly can't do it for a thousand people or a million people or building houses over a hundred square miles in dozens of different locations and places. And this idea that this could all be planned out ahead of time, maybe even years ahead of time with some five-year plan or something like that. Uh, this, I think this example here helps to illustrate just how unworkable that is. Yeah. And he gets back to, again, the idea he's, he's offered before in his book, Socialism, how important math is in all this. And I believe it was back in part three with Per Byland, where Per said, you know, the idea to ex of expressing valuations, however subjective and however cardinal, not ordinal, um, using, you know, mathematical terms is actually one of the great achievements in human civilization, the, you know, to have profit and loss and to have an accounting ledger and see where the money's being spent to, to allow that accounting function to help us better visualize uh, how to allocate resources is actually a huge, <laughs> a huge part of civilization. And, and he, um, and I think he mentions this a couple of different places on 697 where he says that, you know, this is the hundred year problem of socialism is, you know, this is the main political issue behind socialism is the inability to, to plan because you don't have price calculation. Then he says, he follows, he says, the mathematical economists are almost exclusively intent on the study of what they call economic equilibrium in the static state. But when you're trying to use math uh, to describe, to, to, to arrive at a steady state uh, formulaic answer uh, in, in an economy that's never steady state, it, it leads to problems. Right. The idea of this... Uh this economy that has reached some sort of stasis, some sort of equilibrium, it's helpful as a model for, for describing some things, much like the, the liberals' uh, idea of the ideal society and so on. But once you start deciding that, okay, this is what society is now, this is what all our needs are now, so we'll build an entire production mechanism around it. Uh, the thing is, is that doesn't stay the same. The weather changes. There might be an early frost. Your demographics might change. Um, there could be any number of things that change. The availability of some product and demand. These are all things that happen all the time. And something, by the way, that any business owner knows. They know that there's all of these variables that are constantly changing. And often you can't even really know why they changed or what people were thinking as to why they stopped buying that product and so on. But you got to roll with it. You have to make adjustments. And a business owner knows this, but the, there's interestingly this idea among many economists and scholars that, nope, you don't actually have to make those constant adjustments or we can somehow design a computer program that will do this. Uh, but that's just not how the real world works. That, yes, you want to have data uh, through the price mechanism. You could also, and of course Mises wasn't opposed to economic history in the sense of trying to reconstruct how the world has worked in the past and trying to have that help you into your decision-making in the future. But that's different from simply entering a bunch of numbers in about the current situation right now and then saying, well, this will be our guide for all future decision-making about the economy because reality quickly changes from what the model says. And then all of your attempts at, uh, at then making those calculations become useless or extremely wasteful. And in many cases, that can lead to things like hunger and real shortages and, and, a, and a big decline in the standard of living. Yes. And he has this interesting section in this chapter where he's listing out some of the different suggestions for economic calculation under socialism. And one of those is just straight math. Uh, differential equations. And I, you know, uh, if, if we remember back to our calculus class in high school or college, it's been a long time. But I mean, differ differential equations, you know, you've got a function which has generally some sort of physical quality. And then you have a derivative, which usually rep which represents a rate of change. And then the differ differential equation for which you're trying to solve, you, you know, defines the relationship between the two. And there's a, there is, I think, I think we can understand the allure of, of functions and equations to solve human problems. I mean, we like the idea of a, of a nice, neat 
math answer. So I, I don't think, you know, we, we spend a lot of times criticizing mathematical models in the Austrian world. And, and of course, uh, models in general, epidemiological models are being severely criticized right now because of the COVID cr uh, virus crisis. But, you know, it, there's something very human, Ryan, wouldn't you agree about trying to fit uh, human activity into boxes and, and solve things using math? I mean, we, we can understand the appeal. Right. Uh, I understand why people like math, right? Two plus two equals four always. It's, that's very reliable. And so why wouldn't you want to understand then immutable truths in that way by coming up with just more complex equations about how production takes place and what it is that people need and want and where those goods and services can be obtained and uh, and there's and of course you can come up with when you go through a a mathematical proof, uh, it's very beautiful in a certain sense. And I always enjoyed geometry uh, for that reason. I love those geometry proofs that we used to do uh, in tenth grade. <laughs> but uh, the it, the economy doesn't work that way because it's got so many unknowable variations and the conditions of the world change always and constantly. And and that's Mises' point, is you don't really know what uh, the variables are in these equations. And if you were to, to do them, you would have to constantly change them. And so you would need to, you'd probably need to spend more time inputting data into these equations than actually just getting on with your life and producing goods and services. So why not just actually produce goods and services in the marketplace as best you can and, and devote your time to solving the problems of production, which are substantial, right? Because the physical world is constantly changing and the demands of, of people and their families and based on uh, their different demographics and all of that is constantly in flux. So that's a, that's a problem all of itself. Now, I know some socialists would still say, we have, well, and I've heard them say this, is, well, we have more powerful computers now, and this is the era of big data, and mm -hmm. that'll that'll uh, that'll handle it now. But this brings me back to the issue of uh, that political scientists have often had to contend with, and the the more savvy ones know it's a real problem. Is now kind of the the uh, the holy grail in political science is democracy, right? Is well, we can have a just, well functioning state if only we we get the kinks out of democracy. But even then. Even the smarter ones admit, how do you translate to the will of the people, whatever that is, some majority group or whatever, actually into state action or, or lack of state action, whatever? How, do the, how does it move from one place to the other? And that problem's never been solved, right? How do we transmit uh, the needs into uh, state action? And the, and the same thing happens here. Right? How are we going to transmit the needs of production and consumption into these powerful computers that are then going to solve the problem for us? Because it's not like even here in the era of big data that we can just stop collecting data now because, well, we've got, we got 20 years worth of data, so we got it all figured out now. Uh, even they say, well, we, got, we have to keep refining the model constantly. And so I guess the idea here is that, well, we can refine the model well enough that we can address everybody's needs and so on. But uh, show me a place where that whole idea hasn't failed miserably. Uh, I mean, the current crisis is a case right here. Like, I'm supposed to believe that people at the WHO or people in the Italian government, well, because it's the era of big data, uh, shouldn't they have been able to calculate these things that were coming down the road? Uh they, they failed miserably at it, and but that's what we're being told, is that we can see into the future now because we can, we can see these things that happened in the past. But of course, they're always full of, uh, full of excuses. Anytime they, they fail to predict something, oh, it's because it's a black swan event and we couldn't, we couldn't predict it, so therefore it, our, our model is to be excused. Well, I think Mises might say the world is constantly full of black swan events, some of them large and some of them small. Just because they may be smaller doesn't mean they don't matter. And I think that's what they try to say with these models is, well, the smaller stuff we all got covered. It's just the big stuff that we always fail miserably with. Well, that, I, that doesn't offer me very much comfort.
Well, what's so interesting is as you look at the coronavirus crisis, at least it, it, implicitly, we think that data is faster now, that we can hear about, you know, the number of deaths in Italy almost on a real-time, day-to-day basis. Unlike 30 or 40 years ago, we'd have to wait for the newspaper or once a week or something. But yet we have more data and faster data than ever, but it seems like we're missing the forest for the trees. And we've certainly done that with coronavirus because we're, we're interpreting things uh, uh, you know, out of whack. There's no question about that. And this whole shutdown is a result of a of a gross misinterpretation of data and and a, a false alarm, basically uh, a hysteria, a panic. So, data is not always what it's cracked up to be. And you know, I get your point about people now say, well, there's AI and there's this and that. So Walmart is kind of almost a little country unto itself and it can figure things out. It's socialist, but but people forget Walmart is using prices. It's using uh, prices for labor. It's using prices for, uh, you know, suppliers. It's using prices for its the property it buys. It's using prices for uh, everything it does. So uh, it, not so simple. And when we get past math and differential equations, uh, Mises also offers at page 699 some other suggestions for socialist economic calculation. I thought these were very interesting because occasionally he lists things, and we all love a list, right? And so he mentions calculation in kind, which would be sort of almost barter. And he says, uh, you know, that's that's in, instead of in money monetary terms. So he says that's very obviously very inefficient and no good. And then he says, well, we could use the labor theory of value to determine uh, prices. In other words, how much work and effort does something take? He says, well, we've already, you know, we can go back to Bomberwerk and they, those guys, uh, you know, blew to smithereens, the Marxist labor theory of value. Uh, but what I really like, Ryan, was number three. He says the unit is to be a quantity of utility. So I thought this was really interesting. If we could somehow compare utiles or some something other than a dollar, some measure of utility, almost like the way we measure energy or heat or something in physics. And it almost reminds me of the old uh, idea of Esperanto, the universal language where we could you know, get scrap English and Mandarin and, and, and French and all these languages. And everyone could come together and speak one language. And, and our, own, our great friend, Dr. Leland Yeager, who died a few years ago, who was a longtime professor here at the University of Auburn, a great friend of the Mises Institute, he was actually a connoisseur of languages, spoke six or seven of them, in, in, including Esperanto. Uh, by the way. So he was very interested in this. And this was kind of a faddish thing in the 70s that we're going to bring humanity together by creating this you know, universal language that which we all speak. And, and I, I don't know why that popped into my head when I read this, but it did. The idea that we're going to have a, a quantity of utility. But Mises says, no, 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 this is no good because in, in fact, w- you know, everything's about gradation. We, we prefer things um, you know, based on our subjective desires for them. And so, uh, you know, th- there's a, a mistake when people think when uh, two parties arrive at the price for something, let's say you're selling a car, someone else is buying a car, and you agree to a, 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 a used car for $15,000. And so we assume, uh, or there's a, there's, a, there's a problem in assuming that the two parties then value the car at $15,000. And Mises reminds us, as he's pointed out earlier in the book, it's like, no, 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 the buyer of the car values the car more than the fifteen grand he's giving up. The seller of the car uh, values the fifteen grand more than the car he's giving up. So, it, you know, it's an imperfect um, w- way of measuring things. But it's, it's, again, you know, very seductive if we could just come up with a, a utility function. Uh, and, and so then, Ryan, he gets into this Really interesting uh, exposition, which I think goes to your analogies about the Soviet Union and shutting things down and having, but immediately just having the government run big things like railroads and and leaving small things to to the the syst- or to the market, even if that market is a black market. Uh, he gets into the section about the quasi market, and and so what what's he getting at here? He, he's he's basically talking about. Um, attempting to mimic the market, but in a socialist model. Right. And that was invented as a necessary workaround because it just quickly became apparent that you can't have pure uh, socialism. And so uh, Mises says, yeah, the older socialists still thought you could do that. But okay, we all admitted now you need to have some sort of market. And uh, 
the the phrase he uses here that I enjoy is he talks about how they want people to play markets as children play war, railroad, or school. Mm. They do not comprehend how such childish play differs from the real thing it tries to imitate. Now, anytime Mises mentions children, I'm immediately suspicious because I wonder if he was ever in the same room as children with children in his entire adult life. But in this case, he is correct that uh, imaginary play is extremely different from the real thing, right? Obviously, a war game is nothing like real war. And uh, I think that's an apt analogy here is they're trying to recreate a marketplace without having an actual marketplace. And so, of course, people, com- uh, they, they behave completely different. But it is this idea that, uh, okay, we can set up something that's real similar to markets and we'll just, we'll act like it's a market and then we can just proceed from there. And to a certain extent, that's, that's what we're seeing from uh, the central bank so much now is, okay, well, we don't really have a market anymore in terms of stock prices or mortgage-backed securities and so on, because we as a government entity are creating new money and purchasing these things and constantly manipulating uh, the prices and the demand. But we have data. We have spreadsheets that tell us like what might have happened and maybe what we should do to make it happen under more ideal conditions and so on. And in that case, you don't have a market at all. And uh, so, of course, Mises would explain the sort of bad things that result from that uh, over time. But to a certain extent, that's very much the world we have entered into in the last, well, at least 20 years, where the more regulation you have, the more you have government subsidizing and purchasing things, the more you are in an economy where um, we're just essentially trying to go through the motions of how a market behaves while not actually having a functioning price mechanism. And so I think the, the ultimate outcome is essentially a sort of interventionism. But, uh, but he's talking here in the context of socialists trying to recreate socialism using this sort of interventionist method. And it just doesn't lead uh, to what you want it to do, because you just simply can't really know what is needed in terms of labor and consumption and, and capital and all of those things. Well, I was struck uh, reading page 702 and 703 that maybe uh, the modern analogy is in the concept of transfer pricing, where you have big multinational corporations and they have uh, divisions and uh, subsidiary companies all around the world. And these companies all deal with one another, sending parts and supplies around and labor around. And so what they might try to do is kind of juice their earnings for accounting purposes or, or uh, you know, juice their tax payments for tax purposes by, by adjusting the, the prices that they use between each other. And, and so, in other words, uh, you know, try to put all the profits into low-tax jurisdictions and try to put a lot of the costs and deductions into high-tax jurisdictions. And, and by doing all this, you know, um, minimize their taxes and, and make their uh, book accounting look as profitable as possible. And that's why uh, under both gap rules and under IRS and other taxing jurisdictions, there are rules against transfer pricing. So I guess this is a little bit of analogy. You brought up AI earlier. You know, w- within a company like Walmart or within a giant company like GM with subdivisions and and, hold, and uh, operating companies around the world, um, and, and, you know, we've got the transfer pricing model, there's still, there's just not the right skin in the game. In other words, if we consider... Uh, whether you're Walmart or GM, that the owner at the top is sort of like the government. All all the way down through the organizational chart, whether GM or Walmart, um, it's it still rolls up into one entity. So you don't have the right incentives, you know, sort of top to bottom. Yes, I think this issue is very important. It takes us to Mises' discussion of bureaucracy here uh, and how that contrasts with the role of the the entrepreneur. So. In the case of bureaucracy, you've got managers and you've got CEOs and people who are running a company who they, they are making decisions in terms of trying to minimize stock prices and, uh, or, or minimize tax, um, tax burden and maximize stock price. And they've got lots of things that they're trying to do. However, these people aren't entrepreneurs uh, because they're trying, to, they're trying to manage a company. And that is different from trying to really anticipate what the company is doing, uh, or, or rather anticipate what it is that consumers are going to want in the future. Uh, 
anticipating what direction the market is going to go in overall. And also these uh, bureaucrats, essentially what they are, they're private sector bureaucrats, these people who are running this private bureaucracy, they may not have skin in the game the way the entrepreneur does. So when Mises is talking about the entrepreneur, he's talking about someone who has some risks, risk in this venture, people who have uh, perhaps put their time and energy into creating this uh, enterprise, and they're different from the people who've been hired to run it. And so it's the entrepreneur who is a very key person in actually dealing with the problems of the division of labor and dealing with changing conditions. Because yes, we can have uh, people who are running a company and they can certainly make decisions and attempt to deal with uh, fluctuations and taxes and prices and, and risk and all of that. But they ultimately have different motivations and a different role than the entrepreneur does. And, and Mises is careful to make that distinction here. And he talks about this, of course, uh, in his book, Bureaucracy, as well. And that the, the, uh, the worker, the planner, the chairman of the board, that sort of thing, even though it is private sector, these people should not be confused uh, with entrepreneurs. And that was a big reason, which I should have mentioned earlier, a big reason why things are constantly changing in the marketplace is because entrepreneurs come along and they see how things can be improved and they change it. And then your whole market changes again. The entire market environment changes and then your models again are useless because they, of course, almost by definition, couldn't anticipate what some entrepreneur was going to come along and do. And that sort of thing, I mean, I guess that's in a certain sense a black swan event of its own, as you had this entrepreneur came along, he saw a completely different way of doing things, and he did it. The market's totally different now. And then, of course, he will hire, if he's successful and he can build up a sizable enterprise, he's then going to need uh, his own business bureaucracy that can then carry out um, his wishes to a certain extent. But even then, he's going to be constantly looking for how the market changes. Uh, but he fundamentally is different from those people who are actually running the company and just carrying out the orders uh, of the entrepreneur. Well, I think that's actually a great point to end our discussion today on this idea of equilibrium, because the notion that socialism can uh, uh, figure out prices for the economy, well, equilibrium in a market economy is something which is never reached because supply and demand are ever shifting and consumer tastes are ever shifting and uh, producer products are ever shifting. So equilibrium is a tendency. It's not something at which you ever arrive. And so it's a mistake, as Mises says, to, to think that you could use math to compute the state of equilibrium because you're trying to, to find a static thing in a dynamic world. And then I'll leave the audience and we'll, we'll cut out here with this, calculate, with this quote, excuse me, at the very end of chapter 26, page 711, he says, there is therefore no need to stress the point that the fabulous number of equations which one would have to solve each day anew for a practical utilization of the method would make the whole idea absurd, even if it were really a reasonable substitute for the market's economic calculation. And this is something I wonder if the AOCs of the world really understand, you know, the kind of minute day-to-day -day decisions that bureaucrats would have to be making about where to send goods and services, how to price goods and services, how much to pay people. I mean, it's, it's staggering. And in our modern economy, I, Ryan, I think this is something that gives me hope. In our modern economy, we just turn on Netflix and we go to the grocery store and there's 10 zillion kinds of toothpaste. I mean, we're pretty spoiled and we're pretty demanding. And th there's just no way that this could ever be done bureaucratically. And I'm not so sure that uh, today's socialists really get that. Oh, it's it's so much more complex. And I've noted that in a couple articles recently as because this shutdown has been so biased against so many small business owners and small entrepreneurs and even medium size. That is the whole the edifice we're building right now is one that that favors huge corporations at the cost of uh, more agile and innovative smaller firms because they don't get to be counted as essential and that sort of thing. But those people, of course, appreciate uh, just the the level of planning and minute detail that must be paid attention to in order to make an enterprise function. And those you got to let you got to lay people off almost immediately because the money's not coming in. You can't serve people. There's no more 
cash flow. There's you're not making payroll anymore, and and that co- and you can't just take a month off and just ignore what's going on in the economy uh, or the local economy in your marketplace, and just ignore what your employees are doing and so on, and just kind of put it on autopilot. That's just not the way that enterprises function. And large ones can can pull that off for a little bit longer because they have reserves to go off of and they can kind of pretend uh, to not be wasteful for longer. But smaller ones, they just they just go away quickly uh, because they don't have that backup. And that just really illustrates for us the number of businesses that may not be opening up ever again after these lockdowns are over will be a helpful illustration of just how actually tenuous and difficult it is to put an enterprise together and to keep it going and to keep people employed and to keep the cash flow and to keep serving the customers in a way that they need and want. It's not actually easy. Uh, 90% of Americans don't do it because only 10% actually make their living from small businesses. Uh, but I think we would be a different country if, if more people had experience with that and more people realized just how complex and difficult it is to do that. And I think it's the fact that so few people know about it that we can even entertain this notion that, yep, we can just have a bunch of uh, people, maybe even thousands of miles away, people in some government office building somewhere else deciding what it is that needs to be made uh, and who needs to be employed and what they should be doing. It's just completely unrealistic. And of course, you can you can uh, limp along for a while as things become more and more wasteful as the standard of living declines. But how long are people willing to tolerate that? I know that in uh, some of his essays, uh, Rothbard was always optimistic, largely because he felt people simply wouldn't tolerate that sort of thing. He felt that since the liberal revolutions of the 19th century, people weren't going to sit around and let the government impoverish them like they might have done in years past. I guess we'll find out what the <laughs> what the tolerance level is for that to a certain extent. Although maybe it won't come to that. Maybe the uh, the government institutions will become afraid enough of what might happen that they won't push it as far as they could. But we'll see. Well, I hope we don't see, and I hope that this lockdown ends as soon as possible, and that people get back out there doing what they do because um, it's very very scary times we live in. And although, in a sense. People might feel like they should just be uh, you know, online all day reading about COVID or reading the latest about their town shutdown or something. This is actually a great time, as I mentioned earlier, to, to use any extra spare time you've got to go back to first principles, actually educate yourself and improve yourself uh, during this lockdown. And Human Action is the kind of once-in-a-lifetime book that's actually going to make you a better person. Uh, it's, it's like uh, eating your broccoli or going to the gym, as I've mentioned. It's not a junk food book. And so... Uh, we've made it available in our store, uh, mises.org slash store, at a great discount. Just use the code H-A-P-O-D for Human Action Podcast, and you can get either the beautiful hardcover Scholars Edition or a very, very cheap $5 paperback version of this book. It's something you want to own. And if you don't want to own it, uh, just go to mises.org, type in Human Action, and you can find a beautiful HTML version that you can follow along as we're going through these podcasts. And so all that said, that's part five of Human Action. I want to thank you, Ryan McMakin, so much for joining us. And I want to invite everybody to join us again next week uh, as we begin part six of this book with our upcoming guest, Dr. Peter Klein. So, Ryan, you have a great weekend. Thank you. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.